Thank you. Um, we will get started. We're going to have the Honorable Alderman Taylor from the 20th Ward uh, give remarks. So good evening, everybody. I'm Alderman Jeanette Taylor, and I have the pleasure of representing the 20th Ward. And so before we get to house rules and meetings. I'm going to turn it over to the pastor of this house, Dr. Brazier, to open us up with prayer. Thank you, all the women. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. To all the saints, praise the Lord. Praise uh, the Lord. And uh, it is just, uh, it's an honor to be able to be asked to host a community meeting, a meeting of residents, a meeting of, of those who have common hearts and minds, and those who are looking to solve issues and have been asked to lead us in prayer so let us pray now, dear heavenly father in your name we give you honor glory and thanks for this time that we spend with you and that which we spend with one another we all have interests but lord it is about reconciliation of our interests we ask that you will bless our deliberation on today and allow us to navigate through this time of uh, great misunderstanding and we'll forever you the honor and glory in jesus name Amen. Thank you, Dr. Brazier. And so there have been some things that have happened in the community that we just need to be able to talk about. We all need to be able to be informed as I am now. And I want to be able to have a conversation with the community. And so I want to set this meeting up with some community rules because I want us to do this in respect to each other. The community has been disrespected, but it is a time for us to try to fix what has happened and know that we all have to work together. It's never too late. It's never too late. And that's okay. And so from, I want to introduce the folks on stage, um, and then we'll start with the PowerPoint presentation. And so we have Matt Doty from OEMC. We have Daniel from the Department of Family Services. We have Commissioner Kanazi from DFSS. We have Glenn Cross from AIS. Um, I don't think Deputy Mayor B is here yet. She hasn't made it here. But we have a couple of folks from the mayor's office we have Deputy, Deputy Chief Stephen Chung. We have CDOT um, Alonzo Owens. We have Alderman Ray Lopez from the 15th Ward. We have Alderman Andre Vasquez from the 40th Ward. And we have Commander Watson from the 3rd District. Yeah, what's the next one? And so as you see, this is how the agenda will go. We've had the prayer, I've done the welcome. We're gonna talk about community agreements and then you all can see the agenda. The agenda is an overview. We'll give updates from last week's event, what happens moving forward, community participation, community investment, additional resources, and next steps. Next slide. Be present. Engage and address the issue not the person. Assume best intentions. One mic, one diva, one mic. Move up, move back. Land the plane. We are only here to 7.30, and so we want to give you enough time to be able to have Q&A. And so the presentation is going to go quick so that you all get to see the information they give out, and then we'll leave it up. Somebody should be passing out a sign-in sheet, and there should be sticky notes for people to ask questions. I am turning this over to Deputy Mayor, is she here? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Deputy Mayor B. Coins de Leon. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry for the, the late walk in. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Vee Ponce de Leon. I'm the deputy mayor for immigrant, migrant, and refugee rights in Chicago. Uh, this is the first time that our city has had this position, and it's really an honor and a privilege to, to serve in this role. I just want to briefly share um, how the mayor and the mayor's team has been thinking about this mission and what is guiding the work, and also to give you a quick overview of kind of where we are with the, with the situation, not just here in this community, but across the city. And as you see on the slides, currently we have 5,479 total residents and city shelters across the city. Uh, in addition to that, we have just under 1,000 people, 954 people in our police stations. And then here at the Wadsworth shelter, we have 583 residents. Uh, the mayor has, has talked about this effort as being a humanitarian crisis because we have a sudden rapid number of people migrating here to the U.S. and then from the Texas border being sent on buses to Chicago. It's a number of folks that we really don't control. The folks are coming up here, they're looking for a place to settle, they're looking for uh, a place where they can seek asylum. Chicago as a welcoming city has welcomed them, but it is a lot of work. It's, it's a hard effort and it's all hands on deck. And you've seen that because across the city, we are opening shelters, we're receiving people in police stations, we're partnering with the state, with the county. Lots of organizations have stepped up, um, including faith and other community-based organizations. And the work is ongoing. We, in July, had about one bus a day come in and each bus has an average of 50 people. And so that means every day we're getting about 50 folks that we have to find a place for. If you can go to the next slide. I just wanted to share this map, which shows that the shelters are really dispersed across the city. You see right now the, the green dots on the map show where all the shelters are. And then the next slide, we have a list of the actual shelters and the, the capacity that each one has. Two of them are above a thousand um, families. One is singles, one is families, and that's because they're just larger, larger settings. The uh, combination of folks from the mayor's office and from our city departments have gone and looked at over 200 locations, and we really are looking for locations where we can host a large number of, of people. But we continue to look every day. We are um, reaching out to the archdiocese. We're working with other organizations and just looking at ways that we can find new shelter so that we move people from the police stations into shelters and have made a commitment to doing that across the city. Next slide. I'd like to actually ask um, DC Chan to go over this slide and tell us a little bit more about the incident that happened last week. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us uh, and hosting us in this beautiful church here. I just want to start off, uh, so the incident is happened on the, the 14th of July, on the Friday, in, in, in which essentially a resident ret returned home and saw that her driveway was blocked and asked, asked uh, the group th that was present in the alley to, to, to please open up a path for her to, to get by. It, it got a little heated, uh, things got, objects got thrown, uh, then there was a little bit, a little back and forth of uh, physical altercation, uh, which ensued. Uh, what, what had happened was essentially the, um, the investigation revealed that 17 of the residents were involved. They were actually removed from the shelter, uh, 13 to other sheltering systems, and then four were banned from the, the, the shelter system on the whole. Following that, we had a, a lot of resources deployed out to the Watchworth area, and then actually uh, it was an all-hands approach to like just cleaning up the area, trying to build a uh, relationships from the, with the community and then also with the migrant population and tried to build back some of that lost um, rapport that everybody had prior. It ain't working, trust me. Because I happen to be the one that they got into it with. Okay? Uh, they told them nicely to move and they jumped out of the car and got smart and everything called up, said something wrong to the mother, the kids came down and did what they had to do and everything and then they started throwing bricks and bottles they even damaged my mother-in-law's car who's going to pay for the damage 
So we'll, 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 we'll work through, um, so I think uh, there, there's a slide deck and then we're gonna, we'll address that as well, uh, following up. So why were none of those arrested? I was arrested for stepping on the property. Why weren't they arrested for committing yeah. assault? So we were hit so on So now we're going to talk about what we're doing differently before we open up the public comment. So next slide, please. So we've increased the staff at Wadsworth to 29 people on site. One of the night supervisors has been replaced. We brought on a more experienced leader because we know that the issues that happen at night in terms of enforcing curfew is important. We've also added additional residential aid and two additional favorite security staff to support the internal supports of the shelter. Um, additionally, in terms of addressing the concerns, um, we've heard that um, we need a couple of things, right? So it's the increased leadership. And so we brought in team members from other shelters who have handled much larger shelters. We have one that's 1,200 and one that's 1,500 um, to make sure that this team can learn and grow from that. The second thing is making sure that across our shelter system, we have 14 shelters with more opening this week that all of our shelters are consistent. As we said, those 17 individuals were banned from the Wadsworth shelter, and that's really important because violence is not condoned, period. We have a no tolerance policy for that. Um, the other thing is making sure that we've done more overlap between the day shift and the night shift. So it was 7 to 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and then the night and the day shift didn't connect. Now there's over an overlap for 30 minutes to an hour for those two teams to talk about what were the issues of the morning so that when you have two teams that they're enforcing the same thing. Um, and then making sure that we have coverage of the surrounding areas. Later, Glenn Foss will talk about not only how our tech staff are working the perimeter, but also the SkyTech security is doing the same. Next slide, please. Additionally, um, we're having making sure that our residential aides and our shelter managers are having um, house meetings with the staff, and that includes the curfew. That is a deal breaker. If two people, I'm sorry. But that's part of the, the more, the stronger enforcement and making sure that that night shift is able to do that. The second thing is, and we'll continue to do this across the entire shelter system that we have. As the deputy mayor said, we have 5,400 people that are in 14 shelters curfew, no drugs, that is still a zero, to a zero tolerance for that. <laughs> Last thing is that we're reminding teams to be good neighbors. Part of what we'll talk about later in the presentation is how we're working with community-based organizations to help people understand cultural norms and what may be acceptable in their home country is not acceptable here. Um, the other <laughs> Last thing, we are issuing an RFP that will bring in so that we will not have contracted staff, but actually local CBOs to manage the shelter system. And so that RFP will be going out in the next several weeks. Next slide. We talked about the curfew. The park closes at 11. We'll continue to work with AIS as well as CPD to enforce those rules. And then the building and loitering. You've seen that the, the senior building, we've had meetings with CHA. We have close relationships with them and have said that if people are trespassing, they can sign a notice and CPD will remove those individuals. Um, we understand the importance of that. Next slide. Glenn. In terms of security uh, on the exterior, um, we've added two additional security personnel through favorites and one additional officer from SkyTech to the premises. Now, what we're doing now is we're making sure that there's no one standing in a cul-de-sac. No one standing on either side of the street, on the east or west side of the street. We're moving them along, uh, and so that's that's something that that's something that has been implemented. Uh, they out there right now. Soon as today, um, I just left from over there myself. I did a tour. I helped escort many of them off the property. And they didn't go nowhere. And so, back there tonight. And as they continue to come back, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not going to say they won't put, put forth the effort to come back, but the security officer's responsibility is to make patrols every 30 minutes to make sure that they are moving. If they're not moving, we would then get police involved. And also the uh, DFSS will also issue notices where they will have their privileges revoked after two stern warnings. So these are some of the measures we're taking place and we're doing now uh, since the incident occurred. In terms of ticketing and towing cars without proper registration, that's something we're enforcing now. 
Uh, we had the privilege of having CDOT go out and put up signs, no parking signs, mm -hmm. in that cul-de-sac area. And we are really enforcing uh, the towing of cars, the ticketing of cars, who are not authorized to park. In fact, there are no cars are authorized to park in that cul-de-sac. Uh, that stands true with our licensed street vendors who are being ticketed as well. Um, I had a conversation myself with one of the vendors and let them know very clearly, if you don't have the license, you cannot, you cannot sell food items. And they uh, understand that as well. So we will enforce these rules. Next slide, please. We will use a portion of the back parking lot. That's, this is under discussion as to whether or not um, there will be any additional uh, areas in the rear of the building that can be utilized for parking. Uh, more discussions on that is coming uh, internally with the city. So those are two items that I'd like to just make sure we clearly understand as it relates to the campus maintenance and access. Next slide, please. Okay, so as you guys can see, this actually gives a schedule pertaining to how we are actually patrolling during those particular times. So we have midnights, our first watch is from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. And as you guys can also see, day the second watch is from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then we have third watch, 2 p.m. to 12 p.m. In addition to that, our tag team overlaps with various hours. So uh, in addition to what you see with our tag teams overlapping, headquarters have assigned us an additional resource. So now we can have a fixed post with offices out there that can assist. With the measures that they put up pertaining to the towing, the no trespass, that helps us enforce those regulations. Before, it was pretty difficult for us. We were moving along. And if, if there's no signs for us to write tickets or toll, we did what we could. But now that those things are out there now, that helps us to enforce and maintain what's necessary to try to help uh, with the community. In addition, though, guys, I'm going to start back the meetings with the community so that we can discuss and figure out what we can do collectively to try to make this a better situation than what we have had. Been. So I know we started it last year. Uh, I'm sorry, this year, the beginning of the year, we had a few meetings with you guys. And then afterwards, I think that the very last meeting we had, we didn't have a lot of uh, attendance. But right now, I think with everything that's upticked and what's going on right now, I think we need to get back with the meetings with the community, with the police, and then we can discuss and figure out ways in which we can collectively address that as well. Next slide. Thank you. Um, three points we want to talk about in terms of how we are moving forward. So we know that we need better communication between the shelter staff and others. They will be working more closely with local police to resolve issues more quickly so that things don't escalate and that the response is, is more rapid. We also are bringing in um, several community-based organizations that are able to work with the shelter residents to help them better understand what life is like in the United States, believe it or not, when they, you come from a totally different country, some of them don't even know really where they're located in relation to the city or to the rest of the state or the country. Um, and there's a lot of change. So we wanna bring organizations that will work with them to help them um, become better acclimated to being in the city, to learn what it looks like to be better neighbors in the community and to help reinforce those policies and those rules that we're putting in place. But we know that you can't just put rules up, you also have to work with people to get them to understand and wanna do that for themselves. Um, we understand that the loud music, the different things that are going on around the neighborhood have made it very hard for the seniors across the street, for people who live down the block, and that it's been difficult to enjoy your neighborhood the way you were used to it. We are hoping that with these community groups coming in um, to work, not just with the residents, but also to hopefully build some bridges and communication with those of you who live in the area, that we can move forward with welcoming people in a way that um, is what Chicago is about, and that we can also help these new residents to be better neighbors for all of you. Next one, please. 
the groups that are coming um, on site, the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights has two organizations, IMAN and the Latino Resource Institute of Illinois. We also know that uh, Alderwoman Taylor has brought in some trusted organizations, Sukasa, Back of the Yards, Neighborhood Council, and Precious Blood. There may be others out there. If you're interested in doing the work with these groups of engaging these folks that live at the shelter, um, there might be opportunities there to partner on that and help build a bridge with community residents. Thank you so much. And I just would like to open it up, Sarah, for our question period. Natalie Viegas, mm -hmm. Carol Samuels, Andre Smith, Jay Poole, and Ms. Natasha Stingley. Thank you, good evening everyone, and thank you for hearing me out, hearing all of us out. In Woodlawn, we're a tight-knit and hard-working community with a strong sense of pride, as you can see. We take care of each other and we watch out for each other, right? Especially during challenging times, which reflects our supportive and caring community atmosphere. While we are a vibrant community, we are also very vulnerable. We all know that Woodlawn has its issues. Crime, unemployment rates, community health concerns are just some of the issues that we're grappling with. Now the city has placed over 500 people in one vicinity with nothing to do. And this makes our community even more susceptible and vulnerable to misconduct. Now I'm gonna skip this big part, but listen, the lack of transparency regarding the organizations or entities running the shelter has got to stop. We ask, actually we demand transparency and open communication from the city of Chicago. These two things are essential to building trust and fostering a healthy community. In addition, it's apparent that there is no organized programming being put forth by the city for the folks in Wadsworth. We could be teaching them English, career skills, life skills that could be put to use in this country and they could be contributing to our very community instead of loitering. They're, instead of learning, they're loitering, right? Programming doesn't require a lot of money or organization. This past Sunday, I've organized a I wasn't sure if we were moving on to the next. I agree with you, but there is definitely a need to invest in programming at the shelter. I just want, I, I want us to remember there are 14 shelters in operation. There's 5,400 people, and we have almost 1,000 people on the floors of police stations. The city is working, it's doing its best to move people through the process. There are people going to English classes in some of the shelters or people are coming. There, there are definitely about 200 young people are in city programming. There are things happening, it's just been slow. But what you said is, is very valid and we're working on it. I'll just also add that about 60% 60, 60 of the people who are at Wadsworth actually have a job. We also partner with Pastor Phelps and people are going to ESO classes. In April, we started doing housing resettlement and so there's about 50, 30 to 50 households, which translates to a little bit more people that are actually working on moving out of the shelter if they have not moved out already. And so more, rapid, more resources for resettlement will be coming to help move people along and out of the shelter.
Good evening, and thank you for having this meeting so we can, I'm not here to complain, okay? I am here to get a solution to the problem. And there was nothing on those slides about us, the residents of Greenwood and Woodlawn. Every slide, every slide could address the, the asylum seekers. What about us? Okay, you didn't say anything. And all of these rules and the things that you're doing, when did you start? Because the weekend at two o'clock in the morning, there was 30 young men standing in the middle of the street. They're, they're choosing not to go into the shelter. They're staying in their cars. They are wandering up and down the streets, in and out of their cars, okay? So what you need to do is that you need to police the police people better, us and them. Oh, because before there's a major issue, because it's already been one. Okay, now, uh, it's too many people there. 600 people? 600 people? The building cannot, the building itself cannot sustain that many people. The sewer is backing up in the back parking lot. Okay, we have called you guys about it. And that fence you put up, you didn't put up a fence. You put some mesh up on a fence that's already falling down. I want to know what you're going to do for us, because I haven't seen it, okay? I have not seen it. I have emails and calls and calls. And Alderman Taylor, I call you, I text you, I email you, I reach out to you on social media. You're not And everyone in my house voted for you. We have upstairs and down, and you're not serving, servicing us, okay? And my other thing is security. How do you expect 29 security people to police 500, 600? That's right. So I didn't respond to you because I didn't have any answers for you. And when people text, hold on. So this this is so, let me say this. Everybody thinks that I knew about this and I had no clue about it. So, and, and, and that absolutely is a problem. So I'm, I did not know. And, I, and you see me out there three times a week standing in the middle of the street with everybody else up here trying to help figure it out. I'm out there three times a week, and every time I'm out there, Deputy Commander is standing out there with me. Deputy Commander is standing out there with me. Somebody from AIS is standing out there with me. CDOT. And so I have been there. But I am just not getting, I didn't even know the organization that was in there. And to be honest, they are part of the problem because they are not enforcing any of the things that Commissioner Kanazi is asking them to do. So let's start there. I didn't get a choice. Now I'm being told that we got to do an RFP. I have not because I did not have answers. Any other time when you call me Miss Carol, me and you have taken each other back. I did not have answers for you, which is why we didn't have a meeting. It makes no sense for me to keep bringing you all out here and I have no answers. It, it, it absolutely is unacceptable. It's also unacceptable for me to get on the phone and lie to you as well. And I'm not doing that for you and anybody else. What's fair and what's right, and I said the mayor, he owes you all an apology. This is not something any of us asked for. And I remember saying clearly to everybody that I did not want this in this part of the board because I knew this was going to happen. I've been saying that from the beginning, but of course, you got folks who are saying this. I want them to listen. It'll be a year in October. They told us two years. I expect them to be out that building in October of next year. That's the conversation that I'm having with them because the community deserves to know, want their building back, and they get to decide what they want it to be. That's just what it is. The people who are keeping up the trouble are the people who are kicked out of the damn shelter. That's the problem right there. And there's no plan to find them somewhere to go. That's part of the problem right there. Number two, you are absolutely right. There was not a plan. And I dare going to show what's included in the plan. And so what I'm asking is, this administration has been here less than 90 days. We are working on it. And yes, nobody wants to hear that. It's been a fight. And I'm going to say this to everybody, and I don't care who take it personal. Because if they were Haitian, Nigerian, or Ghanaian, would none of this be stood for? So let's make it clear. I'm just as bad as y'all is. But at the end of the day, what I'm asking people is, give me an opportunity to work with this administration. Half of the people here are new, and we are working on it. I'm taking y'all recommendations. I'm standing out there. I've been cussed out several times, standing out trying to figure out what is it that we do. And the biggest problem is when they 
can't keep people out. There is nowhere for them to go. So they are standing outside, which is a problem. I've had a problem with it from the very beginning. I never wanted this in the community because I knew this was going to happen. And so at the end of the day, it makes no sense for us to meet. I'm not going to meet about the people. I'm not asking y'all to meet about the people. Until they had some answers and some work actually got done is when I said, let's wow, hope they meet. And let's not act like the previous administration didn't have secret meetings with certain people when they should have been informed in the entire community. And you all knew that I was not a part of any of those conversations. And she don't work here no more. My name is Andre Smith, and, and, and Alderman, you know, it's amazing that you gave a better speech when I was at City Hall fighting for y'all not to release the 51 million because y'all already released 112 million. Alderman uh, Lopez, thank you so much for voting no. And I see that you're here in the 20th Ward representing when you don't have to be. But Alderman Jeanette, Taylor, she gave a good speech, she cried, and then she voted yes to release the 51 million. Now here's the problem. This is my two minutes, man. This is my two minutes. So, 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 I was arrested for stepping on Wadsworth property, me and my friend Tyrone Muhammad. So we as the community demand that them 12, 15, 17, Migrants, immigrants that that assaulted that family be arrested. You know the name. You know the name. Just remove them. We want to see them arrested. Now, how how can you enforce the law when they don't have any identity? When they don't have no identification? How can you enforce the law? How can you enforce the law of the migrants when they don't have no identification? As you can see, this is a disaster. And I'm saying this, all the Jeanette, I'm looking for you to demand that everybody that worked in Roswell be fired immediately. They are a disaster and they are unacceptable.
My name is James Poole. I'm director for Chicago Against Violence. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Alderman Taylor and Commander Watson for some of the things they have done within the last week on cleaning up the area. Um, I know it is a hard thing to address right now, but first of all, what are we going to do about the additional parking for the seniors in the building? Yeah, some of them are actually pretty much a lot of them out there are scared to walk. They used to walk around the neighborhood, they can't walk now. Um, I heard from some of the neighbors where they have been approached, cussed out, but let me say this, they got one more time to deal with it, because otherwise, next time they deal with it, they're gonna deal with it from the streets. We're gonna take over. Nobody's gonna be able to stop us from what we're gonna do to them. And that's all I got to say. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I live in a community. My name is Natasha Stangley. And I've been living in this community for, Jeanette, Ms. Jeanette, you know me. I've been living in this community for about 10 years. I was um, placed in this community due to my daughter being killed to gun violence. So I had to relocate it from, they relocated me due to the circumstances. But I haven't been safe. I had to change everything. My son goes to the University of Chicago High School, and I had to start walking him to school because one morning when I was actually walking him to school, the migrants or whatever was saying something to him, and I got into an argument with him because he's trying to protect my son. He's a child, and he should be able to walk freely to and from school. I have to change my walk. I get off work at 11 o'clock and I check, take the bus and the train and I actually have to walk through that lot over there. And it's very dark. I would suggest that you all get lightning because due to the fact when I was walking over there, they were following me. I had to call my sons to come and come get and help me because they were following me and making gestures to me. And I would ask you all to go out there, go out there at night, in the middle of the night, and see what goes on. I suffer from PTSD already. I had to start taking Ubers to and from work due to this. So my life has changed again, not only due to my daughter being killed, but now you all put these people over here with us. And I, I, I don't understand. So what am I to do? Now I have to spend more money by doing, taking Ubers. I have receipts. Who's helping me? Who's doing something for me and my boys? So I'm asking today, who's going to help me? So the University of Chicago started this at the end of the school year. But because we started hearing that we are having those problems with the people standing outside, so during the school year, and if they have summer programming, not only will you see CPD, but you'll see the University of Chicago. We're also going to block off where the on the side of the senior building, because we see all they did was just switch sides. And so we're going to get permit parking on that side of the building. If you notice, they're not in the cold de sec anymore, and they're not allowed to to um, to because they were standing in front of the gate that goes into the CHA parking. And so we're starting to do those things to make sure that it's safe. But like I said again, those are there is not a plan, and that's the problem for the people that they are kicking out. Because a lot of those folks go to work every day. I am sorry you ain't experiencing this, and we are starting to do something about a lot of these issues. So you could give me a call. You got my number. But I'm going to say this. I, sure. I, I don't see some of the things you all been saying up here. I don't see this. Cause so, so to your your point, it, we've only started within the last week, two weeks. Okay, because that's out there. I, I know. I, I walked through that way when I was before I had the Uber. That I 
I know y'all listen. Nobody's saying anybody is here lying. I know y'all not lying because I'm out there three days a week. I go at different times. I even took my mentor out there and literally I'm calling the commander and the superintendent at night to say why they allowed to stand out there. They need to be, oh, absolutely. They doing a whole bunch of stuff they ain't got no business doing. So Stephanie McLean, Paula Jean, Latrice Jones, and Miss Newsom. Good evening, everyone. So as you can hear, the community continues to, continues to feel inundated with trash, loitering, drugs, parking, noise, and most recently, these aggressive, violent acts. We want to know specifically, Commander, the resources that are, that are allocated for CPD to respond timely wow, to protect the residents. The violent act took a 10-1 officer distress call to get an adequate response. Someone could have been hurt. What can we do to make sure that doesn't happen? Two, the city of Chicago is taking on this burden when we have the vast resources of the state. Rather than um, dump uh, 600 some <coughs> immigrants in Wadsworth, why aren't we looking at other uh, collar counties, other uh, municipalities, so that we are distributing this Cross equitably. Okay. Um, I'll let you respond. Yeah, I can speak. So, okay. I'm going to take the first one. So, in response, okay. so in response to what you just stated, mm -hmm. it's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. What we're going to start doing and what we are enforcing right now, we have cameras up. So, I'm going to be proactive with my officers. We have additional resources that headquarters have been giving us as well. So what we're going to start doing, now that we have the trespass and we have all that information out there, we're going to start enforcing that. We have to be proactive. So we need to get ahead of it and stay consistent with that. So that's one. Two, what I'm going to do in addition, I'm sure you're familiar with the Together We Will program. Moving forward with that, we're going to start adding slides as to what we're doing with bonds where we I always state, I need the phone calls, and when we sit down and discuss, and hopefully with what they put in place, we will come up with some resolutions to a lot of this thing. I want... Can, can, can they turn the mic on so we can hear what she has to say? It's only courtesy. My question was about Turn the mic on. Yeah, please. Thank you. 49 seconds. So what happens if the residents break the curfew and they're out, like um, Carolyn said, past 11 o'clock, 2 a.m. is much too late, the noise level for people to enjoy their homes. What happens? They're sleeping in cars. That's unsafe for people that are returning home from work. As a woman, as a female, I would not want to encounter that. What happens specifically with the curfew so that it is quiet after a certain hour? Because this has drastically altered the community. So there's two parts to that. The first one is that individuals who break curfew twice are removed from the shelter, so they can't stay at Wadsworth. They can go to another shelter, but they can't stay at Wadsworth. For people who have left and have been banned from the shelter, we do know that they are coming back because they may have friends or relatives in the shelter, that's unacceptable. So what we talk with Commander Watson is those people are trespassing. And so either the SkyTech security or the favorite staff will sign a trespassing notice for them to arrest those individuals. It's going to be repeat, right? Repetition is the mother of study. So people get used to this is not your home. You can't stay here if you're not in the shelter. The second piece to me, I think your second question was around what are we doing with Collar County? So I'm going to pass it to to answer that question. Yeah, I'd like to say that the state has been a very active partner in this. Last year, the state had 11 um, shelters that they were operating out of motels in different settings. And that was all state run with partnerships with nonprofits and with um, a staffing agency in order to, to set them up quickly. But now, um, 
there will be some grant dollars put out in the next couple of weeks that local municipalities, so like suburbs and other counties around us can apply for so that they can provide shelter and food and do all the work that we're doing. We're in conversations with several of those towns already. And as soon as that money's available to them and they get their programs going, we're gonna start diverting people from Chicago to those suburbs. They're also even looking to go further down in the state. So potentially like, you know, at least as far down as Springfield. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, would, I would only add um, Alderman Andre Voss to the 40th. Uh, that's also something, the way you, you all are making sure your voices are heard here at the city level, I'd advocate that your state represent, your state senators and representatives also hear from you because we're asking the state to provide more funding. No, we don't need, need no a small money. amounts. No. The, the issue you see happening right now is because there isn't enough funding. They're being placed in Speed buildings that are federal public. Process. Oh yeah, federal as well. I would say raise it also because as far as some of the folks here, the faster they get work authorizations, the faster they can get money, the faster they can get rent, the faster they can get out. So I would say definitely raise that up both at the state level and federal. Hi, good evening. My name is Paula Jean, and it's good to see you guys. And uh, I want to thank the people that are here because it means that they care. And we all took time to come here to be transparent, to try to find solutions. So I'm a Woodlawn resident. I founded Chicago for All. And I have been trying, with, along with a lot of people in our neighborhood, to build black and brown unity. But making, it's, it's a really difficult situation that I'm in and that my colleagues and my residents and everyone is in because these rules aren't being enforced. Now, we were all here in January and we heard that the limit, the capacity was 500 people at that shelter. And it is inhumane to the residents of that shelter and to my neighbors to have more than 500 people. So can we have an action item? Can we have one deliverable that we get that number under 500 people at least? It jumped from 250 people to 400 people in one week. And that makes our jobs as activists and trying to build these black and brown unity really difficult for us. So can we please decrease the number of people that are in that shelter? Thank you. Matt, can you comment on that in, in terms of like why the size of the shelters and how we're trying to balance that? Sure, uh, I won't lie. Our first priority is decompressing our police stations right now. It, it has to be. Um, beyond that, Obviously, we want to make sure that people get to their onward destinations as quickly as possible. We are increasing our resettlement rates on a week-to-week -week basis, which is encouraging. Um, I think absolutely we want to get that number at both Wadsworth and our other shelters. Uh, we want to see that start decreasing. So thank you for your comment. My name is Ms. Jones. I am a Woodline resident. Um, I work in Woodline. I live in Woodline. I raised my children in Woodline. And when this was brought to us, this whole thing happened. Um, the picture was painted how these people needed help. And we had compassion and concern. But, oh my God, what? What, what, what is happening? I, I just, I just want to say that our seniors are being terrorized. The, I can't walk to work. It, it's, it's horrible. That's the only word I can give you that. It's really horrible. And my only comment tonight is that I would ask each of you to take two minutes to just imagine that it was your parent or your grandparent that's being terrorized. <laughs> Lastly, um, I know these new things have been in place for a, a moment, as they say, but last night there was about 35 men outside partying or whatever they're doing, and it is horrible. I just ask that you guys drive by at night and just see. Um, I know my all the woman is always out. I'm not saying her. I mean, I want all of you to take a, to take, just take a moment and just see for yourself and imagine that that was your grandparent or your parent dealing with this. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenny Newsom. I am the Senior South Region President of 18 Senior Buildings 
for CHA and the Central Advisory Council. I just so happen to live at 6360 South Minerva, and I am here to represent the 83 apartments that are on the west side of the building. Now, I'm gonna give you all a food for thought. It's better to walk alone than with a crowd going in the wrong direction. Right. Now, I'm gonna say this. Ms. Ms. Taylor, when she did become aware of it, she did come out. I was out there with her at 7.30 in the evening. Those guys were so disrespectful. Right now, they call me Cha Punta Negra. Every time when I leave out of our parking lot, I would say this. They drink. They deal drugs, there's prostitution, there's some sick, there are, the seniors are afraid. Some of you guys may have seen the picture of where one of our seniors was beaten up very badly. I don't know, the guy came out, I can't get his picture right now, but his family is very, very distressed. 83 apartments, I'm gonna ask you all, why don't one of you all come over there and spend a weekend because I'm gonna say this, this past Saturday, yes, they stayed quiet. Of course, Jeanette cleaned up things when she cleaned off that lot. Let me tell you about the drugs. Everybody over there has a cop. They first came here with two bags of clothing, and they only now everybody got a cop. Now they sleep in the car. They they block us there on University. When I was on my way over here. They were out there kicking a the soccer ball in front of the CBS camera. So guess what? This is what I have to deal with. Friday, they had three boulders in front of our driveway. And then less than 100 feet away, they also had three other boulders near the corner of 64th Street and university. This goes on all the time. And I, like I tell anyone, I'm not prejudiced against these people. Because see, I have Hispanic people in my own family. The thing of it is, they're, they disrespect us, they rob us, they harass us. Miss Taylor was out there and she saw it with me. All right? She's doing the best she can with nothing. Yes. But the one thing that I'm sick of is people that are sitting there on the on that panel that was here that told us Woodlawn residents. Yes. It's nothing that you can do about it. We're going to put 125 men over there and 125 women and the, the plan is in effect and that is it. Didn't you miss Kanazi? I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got it on recording. Live, I'm cut, I'm in. <laughs> Luis Cardona, Mary Henderson, Rashid Buckingham, and the John Allen. Hi, um, thank you. I'm glad everyone's here. It was one of my first in-person meetings. I attended mainly all on, on all the Zoom calls, and this is way more impactful than I than I had anticipated. Um, San Francisco, and I come from a background like most of us are, very embracing different cultures, and that was one of the reasons why I moved to Woodland to begin with. 
And even though when I moved, everybody thought I was nuts, but I said this felt more like home to me than anywhere else in Chicago. So I'm a little protective. <laughs> um, my building that I'm in is situated, we have one entrance on Woodlawn and one on Minerva. And um, I just wanted to have a little story because this is what I thank you guys from uh, Scott Oberg, Captain Oberg, I think it was. Yeah, we had some, because um, I walked my dog there in the morning and it got to a point where I'm just standing here like this when they're doing what they're doing, selling drugs and everything. And so he actually came on Easter Sunday and sat at the foot of there. And I told him, I go, you know, this is great. It is Easter Sunday. But I begged, I begged him, please, 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 we need police pod cameras. You guys cannot possibly handle what's about to happen. And here we are. Um, I was made aware, I don't know the full story of a Venezuelan um, that was found dead. Yes. And two days later, all of a sudden, all the trees and bushes, all the trees and the bushes were all cut down. So I don't know if that's a coincidence or if that was an answer to something else. But moving forward, I beg of you, please, on campus, by Minerva, that cul-de-sac. I just saw something go down again this morning. They put stuff on the ground. I'm standing there. They are, they're not hiding anything. Pick it up. Cameras was the question. Yeah. So I think the question is, can there be more cameras? There, there's cameras and there's CPD pods. There can't. There are camera pods in the parking lot already at Wadsworth. So I think that's the question to take back. Is more cameras. Well, we can just bring back, back the request for the cameras and find out exactly where she's suggesting that we put them. Minerva, the cold is back. Oh, right at that park bench. Or why don't you take the bench out? So we'll document that. I don't know who has to make the final decision to install the cameras, but we'll bring yeah. that back. Thank you. Okay. I'm the one that they had the incident with. Okay? Now. Yesterday, they parked again back there, and they're lucky that I wasn't there, because I was going to handle it the same way I did, we did it last time, okay? And this time, it's going to go worse, guaranteed, because this is, their other employees ain't running the school. They're running the whole school. They're running it. They tell them what to do with everything. Today, I went to try to talk to somebody in management about it. What they tell me? Security told me, no, they don't want to talk to you. So how are they supposed to work with the community? They don't want to deal with none of us because we're right about it, you know? And they're dealing and everything. Two months ago, I'm coming home with my wife from a function. They got the street blocked off, partying. I beat. They look at me all crazy. Okay. So, and then I beat the gang, they all jumped out of the car. So I had to do what I had to do. I jumped out with my gun and I said, which one of you are ready to die? Which one of you are ready to die? Because I'm willing to go to jail. I have my wife in the car and my daughter. They didn't want to go down that way. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to protect what I'm going to protect. And they're getting out of hand. They're, they're trying to run everything. And that, you know, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of everything they're doing. Okay? And you say you are working with the with the resident? No, that's bullshit. I ain't work. That, God forgive me. God forgive me. God forgive me, Lord. Uh, like I say, it ain't working. Whatever y'all doing, it ain't working. 
Y'all got to get more hand on with the residents. Because it ain't, it ain't going on. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I, I will say that there was extremely informative. If, if you have a minute afterwards, uh, we would love to, to meet with you. And then you have everybody that's here as representatives throughout the city. So if, if, if you didn't have any luck with the, the shelter I mean, itself. I So to, to backplay that, this is this I is what we're going to do. I'm going to connect you with my my tap attendants back there. So it's my I'm going to connect you with my DCOs as well. Call them directly. Let me know when the stuff is going on. Hey, well, hey, you call, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. Let me finish. Let me let me talk call, about. Like you call nine one one, right? You call nine one one. Okay. So what what I'll do is my tap attendants back there. Afterwards, I will sit back and talk with you. We are, going, we are going to watch the pods. We're going to start enforcing with, like I said before, these measures that have been put up. We're there. I've been working with you guys how long? I'm, I'm with you guys, right? So you know I'm, I'm going to make sure that I'm a man of my word. I stand to it, right? Okay, so I got it. We're going, we're going to talk in the back. Good job. Good job. Good job. My name is Mary, and I live with Margaret Harris, a part of the building. On across the street, there's no respect. But my concern is that when seniors as myself, handicapped, disabled, come in, they are gathered around so much until we are actually afraid to come out of our apartments at night. Some of us ride CGA, some of us take space. But we need some type of security that to guarantee our safety. And at the same time, a lot of us are here today, tonight, not with action, but with lip service. I say to you, you need to write, you need to make phone calls, you need to sign petitions, call your congressman, call your Democratic representative. If you have to necessary, but I hate the mayor's office. Call them. Let them know what's going on. Don't sit back and give lip service. Miss Taylor can't do it all by herself. Glenn cannot do it all by himself. He needs the community behind that. Don't stand there like you know what you're doing when you're not doing a thing but giving lip service. You know, time out for lip service. It is time for action. It is time to stand up for your justice rights to do what is needed to be done. Don't sit back and talk. Let your hand, your writing do your action. They say the pen is mightier than the sword. Put it to you. Whether you are educated, not educated, you can get somebody else to help you to write. You can get somebody else to help you make a phone call. This is all it takes. Don't sit back and depend on one or three people to do something that you yourself are able by this to do with their own strength. And that's all I got to say. Amen. I second that emotion. For sure. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. So my name is, is D. John Allen, and I am a, a two-year, two-and-a-half-year resident of Woodlawn. I live here with, with my family. Um, I'm, there's a lot that I could talk about um, because we've all seen it. You've heard things commented on up here at the mic or, or from the back. But I really would like to know what is the commitment from the city, from this group of representatives to deal with the increase in trash in and around the school. There are makeshift garbage areas, there are bags tied to the senior building. There was a hazardous waste sign affixed to the fence at the senior building. Hazardous waste should not be outside the senior building. Can we get extra trash pickup? Can we get some additional resources put into the city? This has been commented on before. For as many resources are, that are being poured into the school, what is being provided to the residents? What's the balance? 
for every dollar that's put into the school and, to, and, and, and invested into this migrant humanitarian crisis, where is the corresponding money for the residents of the community? There has to be, there has to be balance. If you put $2 million into the school, where is the $2 million for the people who are, who've been here? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Commissioner, Alderwoman, all Deputy Mayor, Commander, Mr. Glenn. Yes, a uh, very, very good point. I uh, appreciate your comments. Um, I would say that we have increased trash removal. Um, perhaps we need to take another look and see if we need to increase it even more so. So, so I would take your, your concerns back to my constituents. Uh, including my uh, colleagues CDOT as well, and we'll put together a plan to to have more trash removal from here. I look forward to hearing the update. Uh, anybody else from the panel? So <laughs> is Hello. Good evening, I'm Alderman Raymond Lopez, and I actually have another, I have the Gage Park shelter in my ward. And I just want to comment on the garbage issue, because it's something that we've seen not just in shelter locations, but everywhere that the migrants are. Garbage is just everywhere. Um, one of the things that we added is- brought them to this community to bring their trash here? I didn't bring them to this community. You fought against them. You against So, they're in everyone's community. And I didn't bust them here. I'm dealing with them just like you are. So, as I was saying, what we proposed to the city last week was that these operators that are operating the shelters have to also be responsible for the garbage as well as the donations that are coming and being tossed to the side and dropped in piles everywhere because it's unsustainable for us to rely on streets and sanitation, which oftentimes has to treat these almost like they're fly dumps because the garbage is so bad. So we are looking to try and force a more universal approach to dealing with the garbage at all these shelters, because whether it's Woodlawn, Gage Park, Ford City, or anywhere else throughout the city of Chicago where the migrants are, we all have the same issue with the amount of garbage and debris that's being accumulated at these locations because of them. And we can't have one-offs. We need to have this incorporated into the overall master plan when we're dealing with these shelters and the migrants. Well, I'll tell you, we just had that conversation Friday, so we're still working on it. Okay. Yeah, so we actually do have the residents also clean up. They're doing twice a week. What we talked about on Friday was that they would do this every day. So at one of our shelters, the social club, which is on Plymouth and Van Buren, they go out twice a day. The shelter staff go out with the residents so that they take community pride in where they live. In one of our other rest shelters, we also have signs posted about what is appropriate dumping and what is illegal or inappropriate dumping so that people actually see pictures because visualization is also really good to help. What about the community investment? So the community investment, I can't speak to that because I'm family and support services, but I do know that there's over 2.5 million that's coming from the state in the federal in the in their state budget this year to the Woodlawn community and be our I don't know if you have any additional information about those state investments not the details but I do know that Mayor Johnson says very often we need to invest in those communities that have been disinvested in for a long time intentionally and without anything and there are there are plans in the works to do that in a very proactive and specific deliberate way so, yes. My name is Mondelay, I'm the 20th Ward Streets and Sand uh, Superintendent. And I just want to talk to you guys about the, um, you mentioned about the garbage and the bags that's on the fence. Um, I have someone out there probably at least four times a week. And as soon as he goes out there and cleans, it's dirtiest. It's almost as soon as he leaves. He cleans, they throw the trash on the ground. Um, so it's, we're out there cleaning. But Sharice is saying we don't have the equipment to go out there. Just That's like a 24-7 job, and we don't have that capacity to do it, as Alderman Lopez just mentioned. Hey, what do you want to do 
Well, I believe in the in the um, slides that they said that they were going to start towing the cars. Mama D. Jay Hopkins. Helen Greaves. Mama D, Jay Hopkins, Janora Stone, and Trina Humphreys. Um, Helen, greetings to everybody. I sanction everything that Ms. Uh, Newsom had to say, but I'd like to add that the other residents, I attended all three of the press conferences and I uh, interviewed some of the residents. They're not talking about why it was the news silent when it came to the 200 police officers that was fighting with the migrants over there. Why did anybody hear anything about that? And it's not only that uh, Mildred Harris Senior Building is named after Mildred Harris that sits on the Chicago uh, uh, CHA board. And, and it's not just the building, it's a school next to it and a vacant lot. And the whole, all of them are being terrorized. Now, we talk about, uh, I, when my family migrated from Arkansas in the mid 50s, Walsworth was the first elementary school that I attended. And I, the first time I saw it, I said, wait a minute, what, this is an isolated street. What is this uh, uh, school in a cross up? the way from a senior citizen building, why are they putting those senior citizens at risk? Why are they even here in the first place? The location. Now, the uh, HUD manages CHA, and that is a federal concern. We need ICE dealing because two years is not going to happen where we are going to be under siege because of immigrants and refugee rights, and they have no right to be here in the first place as border breakers. I am a slavery crime against humanity descendant and Jim Crow genocide survivor, and we, you can't handle the situation. We want computer. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. As well as I. All right, I'm going to cut on this. I just want to say one thing in response to Mama D, who one of my residents love her to death. The reason why you have to put pressure on the federal government is because all these migrants who have asylum cases pending were given a six year court date, which means their asylum case will not be heard until 2029. So, that's why we need to make sure the federal government does its job, because otherwise this will continue for nearly a decade. So they are not competing for the jobs. But what we do have at DFSS is a whole separate workforce division. So 
we provide over $20 million for returning residents and individuals who need jobs. One of the programs is Career Growth Chicago in partnership with City Colleges, which really is for residents like all of us to make sure that individuals have stackable careers. You can get um, with our program and it's free. Um, you can get a certification in transportation, logistics, or distribution within several days to several weeks, depending on what you want to do, up to stackable credentials in teaching computer science that can be several years. The goal is for people to not only get a college degree or whatever path you want to take, but to get uh, jobs that not only support livable wages, but actually like career development. So I will take a look at that, and that's on our website. The other thing we do is we work with Rice Kit, which really helps people connect with job opportunities. So there's flyers in the back that have the work of what we do with workforce development, rental assistance, um, housing supports, youth jobs. Uh, we do a lot at DFSS. People are focusing on new arrivals, but our budget supports a lot more, and I would just encourage everybody to take a look at that. I feel compelled to just clarify that people don't have appointments in six years. Some folks haven't even been able to apply for asylum yet, and so there is a process. The timing will vary for different individuals. Hello, I'm Janora Stone. I don't just reside here, I live here. So my experience with the uh, immigrants have been me riding my bike uh, through Wiseworth. Been approached by a gentleman that put his crack pipe in my face several times before I pushed him away and a gentleman came and removed him. Same day, I witnessed a drug dealer pull up to sell them drugs. I have witnessed them smoking crack, marijuana on the campus, having sex in their cars. I have never seen any security as long as I am going through Wiseworth. None. How are we going to resolve that for the residents? We have to have safety. As mentioned early on, um, since we've had these increased loitering, we've added additional security. Um, they're now out on the, the cul-de-sac patrolling every 30 minutes. They're moving the residents along as they see them loitering, and we'll continue this effort in keeping the streets in that area clear. Thanks for expressing your concerns. So I'm speaking as far as you're saying, you're gonna take care of 64th Street, watch where the, um, the senior residence is, and the cul sac Well, I stay behind Rosworth, and that was my neighbor was assaulted. I was in the back when he was being assaulted. So my thing of it is, when we come home from work, we want to park at our residence on our side without any confrontation or any issue. They back there rolling their weed, they having sex, and they selling sex, men and women. So you don't need just light back there. They need to not be at car in that alley where we go in and out. Because sometimes we don't use our front door. We use the back door, which is convenient for us. I don't want to be looking over my back and trying to see what they're doing now. And then you guys hear all these residents and all their issues. From this point on, if y'all don't handle the street going to handle the blood going to be on y'all hands. Hello. Um, first and foremost, Alderman Taylor, I just want to say that if they were Haitians or a brown skin and we saw them doing what they are doing now, it, it, it would make the same difference. We would still be up here talking about it. And I've been a resident of Woodlawn since 2009. I'm going to tell you, I was one calling the police. When I lived on university, it was abandoned buildings. I had drug dealers on the corners, gang bangers on the corners. I called the police. And now Woodline is building up. They're building homes. We have clean lots now. We have a community. We have a sense of pride. And now we're to be under siege again. We went through this with the gang bangers, our own people here in Chicago, Illinois. Now you guys doing a lot of lip service. A 
lot of lip service. It's real nice. So I'm going to tell you, it's not about just the minors. Pick them up on the gas station right there on Mobile. Now they start sitting up all the time. And that's all people. All people. Stop them from, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure the residents are upset. They out there with the fold-up chairs, selling the drugs, doing everything the migrants doing. So I'm not going to be discriminated. I want them all put in check. All of them put in check. Because we have come so far. I remember this neighborhood, it was abandoned buildings. We have come so far. I was one of the first tenants to move in my building. And I was afraid because I was the first one. We have come so far to give, be given this setback. You guys need to do something. Because I'm going to tell you, it's not a threat, but you know, if that element did win and what's going on here, you already know what's going to happen. Like that game, baby, it's a, it's a game. Some of those are acting like gang members. And, and we still have them here in our neighborhood. We're still trying to get rid of So you guys, I'm just saying, get it in order, because don't nobody want to walk around with their conceal and carry, getting out their car to get in their parking lot or their garage. It's ridiculous. We voted for you guys. Do what you've been voted to do. Count on the business. Live, uncut, unedited. Thank you. I would, I just wanted to restate, we are listening. Clearly there is bad behavior happening. Clearly it's things that need to be addressed immediately. Um, there is a commitment to, to make that happen. There's also a commitment to work with the folks in the shelter in a different way to build community and get them, um, you know, changing their behavior on their own. I do want to say that someone noted 60% of them have jobs one way or another, they found a way to work. Not everyone is doing these bad things. It feels concentrated and we're gonna tackle it. Um, before we wrap up tonight, I wanna thank you for coming, but also ask our Chief Operating Officer, John Roberson, to come up and just give us some closing remarks on behalf of the mayor so that we can um, end the night. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. We are, we are in the house, right? So I want to make sure that everyone hears me. First of all, I want to thank Alderman Taylor. I want to thank Alderman Lopez. I want to thank Commissioner Kamazi, Amanda, and everyone who's here. The mayor asked me to be here tonight to make sure that everyone understands that we are committed to getting it right. What I heard tonight what I heard tonight, what I saw tonight, was my mother. What I saw tonight was my grandma. What I saw tonight was my daughter. That if faced with the same circumstances, would be as emotional, would be focused on trying to demand that something be done. What we have done up to this point is necessary, but it is not sufficient true but the mayor is committed to getting it right now i think this is 10 weeks for us alderman that we've been here but i know for you it's been more than 10 weeks it goes all the way back to august so so what i want to say to you this evening i heard the complaints about the lighting i heard the complaints about the garbage and all the other things that we're talking about. Parking. Crime, parking. And so as the chief operating officer, so what I'm saying is that as the chief operating officer, my job is to run the day-to-day -day operations of city government on behalf of the mayor. And so Streets and Sand reports to me. The other departments report to me in terms of day-to-day -day operations. So what I'm going to do, all I'm, if you give me a chance, if you give me a chance, hey brother, do your thing, man. So when I, so the woman who said that she can't even get into her garage from the alley because of the things that are going on, I'm here to tell you that we're going to work harder to make it right. 
I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm not saying that it's going to happen overnight. But I will commit to you on behalf of Mayor Brandon Johnson that we will get it right. Now, in terms of the other things that someone talked about in terms of the investments, we're going to work with Alderman Taylor. We're going to work with the commander. We're going to work with you as a community. We're not coming in here to tell you that you're wrong. I heard you. And so I'm carrying that message back to the mayor to make sure that all of government understands that we have to get this right. So, so this isn't going to be the last time you're going to see us. Keep going, man. Keep going. This isn't going to be the last time you see us. We are committed to being here. And so, I just want to say this evening, work with us. We're going to lean in. We're not going to sit here and we're not going to put you at arm's length and say that the concerns that you're raising, that you have no reason to have those concerns. You have every right to be frustrated. And so work with us, work with the commander, work with the alderman, and we're going to get it right. God bless you. Thank you. Live on Cut on it. Live and cut an edit. All right, people, y'all heard it for yourself. We were live. It's documented. It's recorded. We can't take it back. We can't lie. It is what it is. You heard it from yourself, from the residents of Woodlawn. I am a longtime res uh, person that lived in Woodlawn for many years. I was born in Woodlawn. I was born in Woodlawn Hospital. I lived on 65th Cottage Road over 21 years straight. So I'm very concerned about that. I started crime chasing in Woodlawn. I started in Woodlawn. So I'm concerned about Woodlawn. So it's on the record. As my partner, Bill Giles Norris, say, documentation beats conversation. And it's all written down. It's all recorded. We're in the house of the Lord. You heard them. So let's see what happens. Peace out. This is live, uncut, unedited. Make sure you share the video. Peace out.